It's no secret that private cellular networking is gaining tremendous momentum. Uh, the capabilities and the impacts are tremendous, especially with respect to accelerating industry 4.0 with factory automation, autonomous driving, and many other use cases. Um, it's exciting, and uh, that's going to be the subject of our conversation today. My name is Will Townsend. I'm a senior analyst with More Insights and Strategy. I manage the networking practice for our firm. And joining me from Nokia is Stefan, who's the vice president of CNS Enterprise Solutions. Welcome, Stefan. I will. Let's get started. And I want to talk about use cases. So from my perspective, again, cellular private wireless is ideally suited for those unconnected OT environments, those non-carpeted environments that have traditionally been either a mismatch of modalities or simply unconnected. Um, so I would love to hear from your perspective and Nokia's perspective, what do you believe are some of the most compelling use cases? Sure. Well, maybe we should start with, with you know, why is uh, private wireless a, a good solution for industry? Because, of course, when you start to um, uh, pull out more data from machines, uh, you know, control machines wirelessly, you can only do that if you have technologies uh, that are very reliable, right? So when you commit more of your business processes or more of the things that you know are important for the economic output of your company or your factory, so that means that you can only start to make those kind of um, um, adjustments and improvements and changes to do more digitization if you have a, a wireless grid that is reliable enough to do. And I think um, you know that's of course the basis why um, why private wireless is, is such a good fit to, to the industry environment. So industry mm -hmm. environments are often a little bit harsh, use cases are difficult, uh, often require very deterministic behavior from the network if you start to do this kind of uh, uh, applications. And cellular is extremely suited for that, right? So cellular mm -hmm. technologies like LTE and now 5G. You know, they have been built for um, uh, difficult environments uh, because CSP networks with their millions and millions of users, deep indoor coverage, you know, they have to work under all circumstances. So that means that the base attributes of cellular technology fits really well to the industrial environment. So you see that coming back in the use cases that um, where basic uh, data connectivity is often present, but then when people start to um, commit uh, industrial protocols to make machines mobile, right? You, you mentioned, for example, AGVs, but we see also huge straddle carriers, cranes and ports, uh, and they say, hey, I want to go to a much more mobile grid, also in factories, but then I need to put these kind of complex um, and, you know, rather, uh, how, how shall we call it, um, brownfield uh, gear uh, mm -hmm. on a wide grid and often that comes with protocols like Profinet and so on and, and yeah and that's where we sell excels so so use cases we see um, ports as a, you know, I already mentioned it an obvious one fairly large space a lot of metal uh, we see a lot of indoor where you have a lot of uplink data because uh, that's uh, you know another aspect of um, of cellular, uh, cellular is very good in uh, getting data back from the devices, right? So often, uh, you know, for example, we are doing this interview uh, on our laptops and traffic to laptops is largely downlink, right? We have our video link here, but our video link is, you know, what is it, uh, 500 pixels uh, or something like that, very low quality, right? But again, if I would have a video camera in, in an industry for, for quality process, I would want to have a 4K camera there. Right? And then I can start to do these kind of advanced use cases um, that would uh, bring economic output for the factory. So, so in a nutshell, all use cases we see, um, you know, they come from um, a need in the industry uh, to have a very reliable wireless grid that they feel they can commit more of their business uh, processes on. Uh, fascinating. Now, you know, cellular is new for the enterprise, right? So. Wi-Fi has long enjoyed, um, you know, success. So, and, and I know, you know, through Nuage, you know, Nokia does have a route to enterprise, which really kind of positions you, I believe, uniquely relative to your traditional competitors. But what specifically um, is Nokia doing to make deployment simple and easy? Yeah, I think, you, you know, you, you mentioned Wi-Fi has a long history in, the, in enterprise, and, and I think that's also the funny uh, that we as a company have gone through in the in the last years, right? And actually, we, we have a long history in private wireless for for enterprises. But for example, in GSMR, right? We have GSMR is a technology where you cover the railways, 
Um, we did the same in energy, we, all of the wide area networks for energy. But then we came to the point that, as you say, hey, now these industries want to adopt the same technology. And if you look to telco gear, so telco gear is very scalable. But the, you know, the challenge is that uh, it's built for CSP. So it starts big and you can scale it, you know, even bigger. And if you then look at the industries, they come in all shapes and sizes. You know, the, the campus can be large, there can be tens of buildings, mm -hmm. or then you would have a single machine room. And I think the, um, the key is that how can we bring the same technology platform in any sort of size uh, or shape of, uh, of the enterprise? Um, and well, what have we done as Nokia? Well, we, we took a step back and we looked at that and we said, okay, so uh, you know, we need to um, look at what we want to retain from our telco uh, base. And obviously radio is, uh, is, is, is one of our absolute stronghold. We looked at our core stacks, but we said we need to um, repackage this in a smaller form factor. And we went there for the two types of solutions. One is a, as a service model, uh, very close to, you know, if you, you would want to start a, uh, a web shop, right? You go to a web host and you, you, know, you swipe your credit card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Putting it a bit simple, but then the, that, but the web host, you know, they create your entire environment. So you don't need to worry about, do I need to buy a server or what platform software? No, they put it ready for you. So we have one type of solution like that uh, as a service product called Nokia Digital Automation Cloud. And if you want to start private wireless, you get plug and play private wireless as we call it. Then on the other side, um, for more CSP-like use cases, um, and also for people that like to uh, uh, compile their own solution. So we have a modular approach called Modular Private Wireless, MPW, where you can say, okay, I'm gonna select my, um, uh, my radio, uh, I'm going to select my Edge Cloud or Edge Core, um, and I'm going to then put that all together in a, in a package uh, by myself. So also there, of course, we've taken some of the attributes uh, to make it more scalable, more easy to use. Um, so, but that's roughly, you know, what we did uh, after what well, we started uh, analyzing this market some five years ago, uh, and we concluded that's that's the way to go. So as a service package, plug mm -hmm. and play, um, we take all the complexity and simplify it for you. And then for users that want CSP like capability, these uh, architecture that you can compile the products together of multiple vendors, we have to solve the MPW. Yeah, and that's very consistent with what I'm hearing. I mean, you know, as a service, I think it's going to make it very simple for the enterprise. But to your point, there, there may be some, um, you know, companies that are very sophisticated, like the German automobile manufacturers that, um, that bring in the, the core competency to sort of manage that. So, but I'm wondering how important is having a strong ecosystem around this to make it successful? And certainly Nokia, in my opinion, and I've, I've commented on this in Forbes articles that I publish and in other venues, um, obviously, you know, Nokia is doing some things right here, but again, how important is, is having that ecosystem to support the solution? It's, it's really important because I think uh, one thing that I've learned over the last few years and we as Nokia have learned is, is that this is a incredibly diverse environment, right? Mm -hmm. So there are so many different segments, so many specializations. There's so much knowledge in the actual use case, right? You mentioned automotive. Well, you know, you need to be an automotive expert to understand how would private wireless fit into your shop floor, right? So, so and, and of course, vice versa, you know, we, we, we work with the automotive to explain how we think they could benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, uh, how have we responded to that? Uh, we, so we have so-called segments, right? So we have an energy segment, we have an industrial segment, um, and we have a couple more. So we said we need to build up a set of industry knowledge and work closely with the industries to try to understand what do they really need. So, so partnerships and ecosystem is super important. Um, one is, of course, they bring in the attributes. Um, and then, of course, the additional thing you need to do is how can they very easily uh, integrate our solutions in their wider package, right? So if you, again, if you would look to a, uh, uh, to a port, and I mentioned these automated straddle carriers, so of course, when that goes into the actual port, so then you know the port user or the port authority, uh, you know they they seek that all of this works end to end. So so that means that in the background, uh, you know we form partnerships with the companies that make these machines, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, it's not just that you put the network there and you hope for the best. Oh, you yeah. know it has to work in a twenty four seven super reliable way. Uh, because these kind of facilities have enormous economic throughput. 
So, so I would say there's a few things then. So there's the segments uh, where we focus on, we have special segment teams. Um, and then in addition, we also focus on selected manufacturers of gear and uh, that we say, okay, we see all of this gear showing up in, the, in industry around the world. Probably makes sense if we pre-integrate, pre-test, have a roadmap together with these uh, companies so, so that the end user, for example, if you have a factory, you will see you have machines there of multiple suppliers. And uh, so, so that that end user that puts everything together, uh, you know, doesn't need to worry about basic interoperability, performance, uh, you know, and reliability of the solution. Yeah, yeah, it's not a trivial undertaking at all. I mean, no. when you when you talk about, you know, like when I think of, you know, um, you know, uh, machinery on a on a shop floor, right? And you know, machine to machine connectivity. When I think about IoT, right? And so, with five G. You know, will be you know, will come support for for massive IoT industrial IoT support, and you know, th there's no question that there's been a lack of standards there for for quite some yep. time. That's coalescing. That's becoming um, you know a little cleaner, but it's still it's still a tremendous challenge. So it's impressive to hear the level of investment that Nokia is making, looking at those verticals and and partnering to, to ensure the interoperability, right? Because at the end of the day, if you can't get that device to connect to the network, you're you're, you're kind of reliable, right? Because yeah, I think it's exactly. really interesting if yeah. you have these, uh, say, these robots, um, especially robots that move. Uh, there's also a you know, high amount of safety requirements. So that means that these robots on one side, maybe they have video feeds for, for video analytics, but they also send heartbeat signals every whatever, 50 or 100 milliseconds. Right. And it, you know, if you miss one, of course, the machine has to shut down, right? That's that's how it operates. So so and that means that the, you know, when you start to integrate with these machines, then you know, you, you, you know, five nines is not good enough. It has to be six nines because you miss one heartbeat, the machine shuts down, and you yeah. immediately cause a, you know a disruption in this entire production flow. So so and these are the kind of uh, you know, interesting aspects that really require that you know you have your partners that you are in the middle of the ecosystem that we as a company accept that. Uh, we are good in telco. Uh, now we are good in enterprise, you know, uh, connectivity. But also that uh, you know, we 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 are open minded to learn what is really really needed there. Uh, and it's an interesting journey. So I have been yeah. to, to places I've never been before, <laughs> I've never seen before. Uh, it's, it's been extremely diverse. And but once you get into that mindset, it becomes natural. So it means, oh, I want to fit in the healthcare industry. I can only there if I look at the healthcare ecosystem and I look at oh, okay these people understand that business so let me reach out to them and understand what is really needed and then you can go to a healthcare provider and say I have something useful for you right so so it's becoming more natural for us and uh, well of course we've been doing this uh, many years but uh, yeah. but yeah it's uh, it's it's it, it, I would say it's it's key to being successful absolutely well it sounds really fascinating um love to travel with you on some of those journeys oh, let's shift <laughs> awesome. Let's shift the conversation. And there's been lots of talk about network slicing, right? And, you know, we've been waiting for it for yep. quite some time in a 4G world. Um, it, it really promises to unlock new monetization opportunities for CSPs. Um, you know, I've been somewhat critical and it's not, it's not targeted at a region, but I think in general, when you look at LTE, um, the operators did a pretty poor job really monetizing that investment. It was really all about access and unlimited data plans, especially in the U.S. Hmm. And in a 5G world, given what you're seeing at spectrum auctions that are being spent, when you're looking at the investments that are being made in, in CapEx, um, you, you've got to find new monetization opportunities. So um, I, I'll just pose this question to you. So um, is there re real value in considering in an enterprise considering a private wireless deployment versus waiting for a CSP, an operator, to offer a slice with a guaranteed level of latency yeah. or throughput to support, you know, their workloads, their use cases. Oh, that's a really good question. I think in general, um, you know, you mentioned LTE, but and, and what is the difference with five G? I think first of all, I think in five G enterprises have far more choice. And I think it's important. So, of course, you know, the slicing will offer some of their use cases uh, a solution. And on the other side, they also have an option to, to build their own bespoke infrastructure. So, so in that sense, I think, you know, it's going in the right direction. And these options will also um, help um, enterprises to choose what is most economic for them, right? Because, of course, you know, the 
industry 4.0 journey and digitalization in general uh, releases economic benefits, but it doesn't mean it's unlimited. And at some use cases, you, you know, you can invest more to tackle it. And some use cases, maybe you need to have a more economic way of doing it. And some of them, if they are wide area, uh, let's say it's a city solution and, and you say, oh, I am an enterprise that provides um, Let's say something, uh, you know, I have a, a delivery company with robots, right? So we're seeing more and more automated delivery. Well, that company it can never build a bespoke network of, on a city level to do that. So that means if he wants to run a reliable service, then of course now with 5G coming, uh, there could be a machine uh, layer or machine slice in that you know, CSP network that mm-hmm. offers the ability for him to reliably control those machines. On the other hand, if you go to a campus um, or a, a, a factory, um, and factories are interesting because typically in these campus networks, you know, you have actually a slice inside your bespoke network, or actually not one slice, but it's even five or six slices. So, so, so there you have a, you know, a deeper granularity, right? There could be a slice for the Profinet, there could be a slice for Video Traffic X, there could mm-hmm. be a slice for, uh, you know, enterprise um, email um, so so you see so there you see you know a, a, a need to in this kind of small setup to segment further into different type of QoS's guaranteed bit rates and so on and of course if you are, are an enterprise that needs that type of granular um, uh, you know, how, how shall we call it configurability mm-hmm. then I think you might be best off with building your own bespoke infrastructure mm-hmm. So, and if you have that, of course, that doesn't mean that there, you know, you don't have a connection with the wide area slide because you know objects come into your bespoke infrastructure and, and leave it again. And also there, I think 5G is offering much better opportunities to manage that, right? So you could go from a special bubble with enormous capabilities, which is your factory, and then maybe some of that what's inside that factory leaves and goes to another facility. And what, so and then you can go into a more limited slice inside the CSP network if you need to stay connected. And then when you come into the next special bubble, you you ramp up again. So we're starting to see this kind of differentiation in use cases and mm-hmm. slices really good to address use cases that, um, you know, in particular address a bit wider geography, such as city areas. Um, and then, you know, these really super high-tech cases like a factory um, or some, a port that you have enormous uplink. Uh, there typically you have to put some sort of bespoke infrastructure. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on the fact that, you know, LTE will do the job given some use cases. 5G will be compelling for others. Um, I I know that you announced a standalone um, solution Hmm. for your private um, wireless deployments. I think it was fall of last year. Um, How does, I'm just curious, how does SA sort of factor into things? I mean, and and for for the folks that are watching, that's bringing um, 5G radio access network components with 5G core, which in my mind really truly unlocks the full potential of 5G. Um, I think, you know, some people have been, their expectations have been let down a little bit because the operators have had to make this transition from 4G core to 5G core. But I'd love to hear, Stefan, from your perspective, what what does SA do to sort of unlock that capability for the enterprise? But even, you know, before I go there, even do a step back, right? So, you know, yeah. I remember when I started this uh, several years ago, I, I visited a factory and uh, I, I did my pitch on the possibilities of 5G and so on. And the factory owner tells me, okay, let's go and have a look at my machines, right? And then a lot of the machines turn out, they are brownfield, right? He says, oh, here I have this PLC of manufacturer X, the PLC is 15 years old, right? And so, so and then, and then I come with my millisecond 5G capability, uh, I'm going to marry that to a PLC that's 15 years old. So, so it means that actually 5G is a, is a learning curve on both sides. Maybe that's important to understand. So, mm-hmm. so, so both, you know, both the uh, uh, ecosystem and industry and enterprise, they, they can look at that, oh, how can I use that best? And how can I, you know, in my next generation of PLC, stick that topic to make you fully use of the benefits 5G has to offer. So, so you know, that's how it's going to grow. And then, and then if we look to 5G SA, for me, 5G SA unlocks um, the enterprise business um, um, you know, entirely, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, again, if you, it's the benefits that you said, it brings the slicing in the CSP side, but also it, if, if somebody wants to build a bespoke infrastructure, you can go immediately 5G with the 5G SA. So the current 5G work still requires that you have the um, uh, LTE there uh, as the anchor technology, right? So if you say, hey, uh, uh, well, well you, you're going to build a private wireless network in your home, 
And you said, I want 5G. Without SA, you would first need to put an LT layer and then 5G on top. And of course, many companies, they are looking at that and they're like, guys, why? You know, 5G is the future, so why can't I go straight to 5G? So, so 5G SA opens that up. And then, yeah, and then if we look to, um, to, the, to the capabilities of 5G, um, obviously um, the initial use cases, uh, you know, like Profinet is a good example, it doesn't yet require the super low millisecond latency. But of course, as we progress on this learning curve and we would go to AR in the work floor, uh, we go to um, robot to robot communication, then actually, you know, you need to have 5G and you need to have this lower latency. And there is this time sensitive networking. So, but, uh, but yeah, so, and that is where 5G opens the door. We can now put that in the floor. Uh, people can start to use it and try it uh, mm-hmm. and, and continue this digital automation journey. And I think the other important point there is that um, uh, everybody wants to invest in technologies that are future proof. And sure. I, think, I think 5G SA, I think is the proof point for industries that, okay, now I'm convinced. Yes. So when I start on this journey, even if it's today with LTE, I know I can continue forever. Um, and I know that what I invest will be reusable and expandable uh, with 5G SA. Yeah. So, so very important. And uh, maybe the final comment there is uh, it's, it's maybe it's shown through already a little bit. I think with 5G SA, we bring the um, affordability uh, to the right point. So because you can uh, build it in a very, uh, how do you say, um, concrete way so it's it's, it's very clean and yeah. you know so you can optimize the setup so it fits the economic envelope of many campuses yeah yeah and that's a great segue to uh, the next question i wanted to ask you you've already touched on um some of the ways that you're delivering private wireless to customers uh, would love for you to share any additional you know sort of context there but also i'd love to understand what you and nokia are doing to really differentiate yourself because there are, there are offerings out there. There are startups that are offering private 5G as a service. I spent time with Cisco um, recently at their Cisco Live event. They, they sort of view their, they launched their, their networking as a service strategy and really view the 5G opportunity um, as a service as well. So um, we'd love to hear just some additional context on the actual discrete offerings and where you sure. believe that you're adding differentiation. Sure, I think, uh, well, on the big picture, there's two things. There's you know differentiation on the edge, uh, there's differentiation on the radio, and then overall there's differentiation on the TCO. Actually, mm-hmm. those three. Not two. So yeah. well, if we start from radio, and I think um, you know this is what I said in the very beginning, uh, you know companies need to trust that they can put their business and you know and the processes that generate the economic output on a wireless grid. And I think of course there, you know, our heritage is extremely strong, and and what we do in the in the enterprise space is that we take our full macro stack and we try to make that usable inside a, a private network. So, so we're scaling it down so that you can actually deploy a extremely feature rich um, stack, which has all the quality of service features. It has all the um, uh, slicing capabilities, the same as a, as a large mobile network operator has. And I think, um, you know, we, we did that in LTE work extremely well and, and we're doing the same in 5G um, and I think people um, sometimes a little bit underestimate the harsh conditions inside these campus networks so if you go in there with a uh, uh, I would say um, radio that is initially designed for home and you scale that up to function in these kind of harsher conditions you're not going to get the reliability out of it that this uh, really required. Do you have six nines um, and to you know to trust that your you know automotive production line uh, keeps running? Right. Mm-hmm. So, so impacts of any sort are you know, having huge economic impact. So 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 that's one thing. So I think we have the radio that can that has the capabilities to deliver the performance needed. And then if we look to to the edge cloud. Um, so the edge cloud, we have said, okay, so, so first of all, you know, our entry ticket inside the, this business is, of course, private wireless. And then we said, so, but what else can we do, right? If we do private wireless, how can we help the uh, uh, enterprises faster on their digital automation journey? Mm-hmm. And I still remember the first time, uh, you know, we connected the HD video camera over private wireless. And you know, I waved my hand in front of the camera 
And then I look at the screen and then, you know, almost a second later, my hand moves on the screen. I'm like, guys, you know, this is not good, right? So it's, it's unusable for a, a real-time, you know, video quality system, for example. So, so it turns out it's not so easy to optimize that, right? So because you have the coding, decoding, of course, we have the latency in the, in, the, in, the, in the wireless system itself. We have a bit of latency in the core. So getting that down to having real, real-time video, as I nowadays call it, mm-hmm. is actually quite challenging. And then, <laughs> sorry about that. And then we learned, okay, so let's say I get everything real-time. And then typically a question people say is, but for my application, I also need to know where, where is this object? Where is the machine, right? So, so how can I couple real-time streaming of video or other sorts of data with positioning? So, and as we went through a lot of these use cases, so we learned there was there are some uh, I would almost but fundamental digital automation building blocks everybody needs to uh, build their use case. Mm-hmm. So we said, okay, so we need to go a step further, right? So yes, you no, know, we bring the business of mission critical connectivity, but we also need to bring positioning. Um, and we think we can do that because if I, you know, put the radio in, I have the other elements. I'm probably in a really good position to also give you an accurate positioning solution. So, mm-hmm. so we do that. We have a couple options there. We say, okay, video, yes, it has to be real, real time video because if you can't have that, then you know the analytics doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, then we have something we call industrial connectors. I mentioned that already. There's Profinet, Canvas, mm-hmm. all these kind of things that, if you just put there a private wireless network. And, and you know you buy a CSP off the shelf again you don't meet that robustness and reliability so we have a set of these building blocks um, that we can run as software applications on the edge cloud and then as we anyway say okay now we have an application platform perhaps we can open that up for third parties to put their applications there so so we so we offer services connectivity we offer a positioning service mm-hmm. we offer real-time streaming service to any third party that brings in the applications which are then tackling the use case itself mm-hmm. so, so we've gone further so we have so-called uh, application framework um, you know you can couple that seamlessly to the private wireless um, environment and everything comes in a very scalable package and I think um, uh, you know, and, and why do I think that's so important? If, if you have a company, um, let's say you are a large logistics company and you have a huge uh, logistics hub in, the, in your hometown. But then uh, you know, in Alaska, you have a small, small logistics hub and you develop all your applications and, and handhelds for the personnel using 5G. Right? So, but then if the solution cannot be deployed economically in the small facility, then what's the point of doing it in your large facility? Exactly. And I think... Right? And I think there we have spent a lot of time to say, hey, we make our technology fit to any type of size. Um, and I think that's one of the differentiators. I think we do better than the others. Mm-hmm. So the final one uh, is, is, is around Spectrum. So we said, okay, let's invest in, uh, in Spectrum solutions. Uh, you need Spectrum. Uh, we work with several parties. Uh, obviously, um, our traditional mobile network operators are, are a preferred partner to do this. At the same time, you can never have enough spectrum. So we are very right. active in, in, in you know, establishing a spectrum that can be used or can be shared, such as CPRS um, and even putting um, uh, cellular technologies in a license. Right. So those are some of the things we try to you know, try to do. Um, we touched already that we, we developed the segment knowledge. We have a large team that does that. Um, and I would say perhaps overall, um, we, you know, we, we have said we, we can only be successful if we, even though we have telco heritage, but we can only be successful if we just take the technology blocks and we become an enterprise company. And right. I think that's kind of the turn we have made, and it's has been a journey um, um, for us to adjust to that uh, to that thinking pattern. Yeah, yeah, you know, and route to market is so critical. I mean, you can have great technology, but if you don't have the proper route to market, you're going to yeah. have limited success, right? So you're making the requisite investments in these verticals. You're you're leaning into your traditional strength in, in RAN, which, which I like. And, um, and you've also developed, you know, through your, your Nokia Enterprise Business Unit, um, a, a discrete focus in this area. And, um, and I would imagine also, you know, leveraging, you know, Nuage and, you know, oh, SQLAN absolutely. and in okay. that footprint to bring to bring a total solution to an enterprise, because at the end of the day, 
you know, I don't believe I speak to a lot of lot of large, you know, companies, and it's they're not necessarily deciding between Wi-Fi or cellular private networking. They're trying to figure out the best connectivity solution for their for their use yeah. case for their deployment, right? So, so that's what I'm, you know, when I look at you against your traditional um, incumbent competitors, that's what kind of strikes me as different is that your route to market to me seems seems stronger. And so, you know, um, I you know I, I keep tabs on the numbers of uh, of customers. Um, I think last time I checked, you know, you, you had 260, you know, private cellular networking customers with many more private networking deployments behind that. Um, do you have an update for us, Stefan? And, and oh, what are you doing well, to continue that acceleration? Wait, well, it's, uh, well, we are, we are definitely far, far beyond that number. Um, don't have the, the current the actual, but, you know, we're clearly, you know, north of that number mm -hmm. and i think the growth is accelerating um, it, you know we can see that uh, now we talk about shipping tens per week as opposed to you know doing the doing one per week right when we started mm -hmm. you know, it was like that so so there's enormous acceleration and i think uh, you know maybe coming back still quickly to what you said uh, you know about ability to offer more to an enterprise you know it is important because i think um, um, again all these elements in itself standalone are fairly complex and i think to be successful uh, you know you need to simplify the technology uh, you know again coming back to this economic envelope you can't send five phds to build it so so it's good to have all these technologies under the same roof and and because that allows us to put a wrapper around it and simplify it but yeah so it grows quite quickly and um, i think still even though it's growing quickly i think we are at the starting point so if i look at the market um you know i would say private wireless I think it's now an accepted concept, and and I can see that, and uh, you know, and we have now delivered enough networks to. Uh, you know, we're not veterans, but we're we're getting there, right? So so sure. we start now. Uh, what what works, what doesn't work, um, and and from what I see in terms of economics, and it's also often talked about Wi-Fi. How do you compare to Wi-Fi? Economics are actually really good. So I think cellular infrastructure leans itself very well to um, uh, create a high a high quality wireless grid with less infrastructure than you can do with with wi-fi it's kind of logic it's a so and, and and we see that coming more and more true and i think the most interesting thing is because we we said okay let's add more value on the edge cloud actually we have um, you know the ability to address use cases that used to be out of the range because of economics and are coming into the range so where i perhaps earlier thought okay um you know we we go for a complex factories as a target now i'm thinking hey wait a minute we are getting so good at this and so scalable i can even go to small retail stores and i mm -hmm. put a small retail store on a wireless on a 5g wireless grid right mm -hmm. and even if that retail store is just one room so so i think um, in that sense um, yeah so it's growing but i think it's going to dramatically accelerate because it seems that um, uh, you know, making the technology easy to use, easy to deploy and downscale it is, is going much better than we originally thought. So, mm -hmm. so I think the possibilities are growing. And, you know, I hope next year we're talking, you say, oh, you have not 260, but, you you know, we talk about, oh, you have 2,600, right? right. So, so that's, <laughs> the, that's the kind of numbers that, that I'm thinking of, right? And, yeah. and I wouldn't see why we wouldn't get there because, um, yeah, that's, that's what the practice has learned fits even better than we thought. And it seems the, uh, the possibilities to make it fit to lower, you know, economic use cases is, uh, is, is, is accelerating, so. Yeah, yeah, really I agree. Good. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And you touched on licensed versus unlicensed spectrum. And I think one of the big sort of watershed, you know, events that's occurred is I call it the democratization of licensed hmm. spectrum. So, you know, prior to, you know, like CBRS, um, only operators could bid, you know, billions of euros and billions of dollars yep. on spectrum. And CBRS has really democratized that and it's allowed municipalities, hospitals, schools, pu you know, public, you know, entities access to licensed spectrum, you know, to do these sorts of things. And, and you know, even within the C-band auction in the U.S., um, there were more than just the traditional operators participating in that auction. So, I think from that perspective, the access to licensed spectrum is really going to be the rocket ship that that really sort of launches. Absolutely. Things. Yeah. So and also, 
Yeah. It's not just for people to, to buy that spectrum directly. It also changes the, um, because we also see now a spectrum available in Germany, UK, other places, but sure. also for the mobile network operators, actually it also changes for them the ability to deliver these kind of bespoke infrastructures because in the past, so they would need to take something away from the consumer business case, right? right. And, then, and then you would need to dedicate that to a relatively small, um, you know, bespoke use case, maybe in the campus, right? And it's very difficult to take spectrum away from a macro base station uh, or, or, or allocate a lot of guaranteed bit rate because you lose trunking gate. Right, so because uh, you know enterprises ask, so depending on the use case, if you have a lot of video uplink, you're going to need to make fairly static reservations, mm -hmm. and that of course eats some of that spectrum. Right. Where normally you have a lot of trunking aid for the consumer, so also for CSPs, I think uh, initiatives like CBRS are wonderful because they can go to that enterprise customers and they say, hey, you already have, you know, uh, I already serve your 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 employees, uh, and now with for example, using CBRS, I can also build you a bespoke infrastructure for your operational uh, and production environments. So, so, so yes, I, I fully agree. It democratizes, this, but it also, um, I think, unleashes our our traditional customers to uh, you know to go much more aggressively in there without thinking what are the consequences if I would do that to my to my. Right. You know, classical business. So. Yeah, I know. Good point. And, you know, it's going to open new monetization opportunities for CSPs. There's yep. no doubt. I mean, certainly network slicing will do that, but but this is a tremendous opportunity for them. And, you know, I expect that they're going to embrace it very, very aggressively. So Stefan, it's been a great conversation. I could keep talking to you for hours about this stuff. Um, we can. Yeah, we <laughs> can. <laughs> but, but thank you again. I want to thank the, you know, the viewers that, that tuned in. Um, I also recently published a white paper um, with Nokia to really educate, um, uh, you know, people on just kind of the ins and outs of private wireless. If you're interested, you can download that paper. You'll see a link at the bottom of the video here, but it's nokia.ly slash private networking 101. So I would encourage you uh, to download that. There's lots of great information. Um, go into a little more depth relative to what Stefan and I talked about today. But again, thank you for tuning in and have a great day.